All right, so I'm going to be doing uh, the chapter 16 notes part three, which is embryonic and fetal development, pregnancy, and birth. <clears throat> so we've discussed the male reproductive anatomy and physiology, the female reproductive anatomy and physiology. Now what happens when we put a male gamete sperm with the female gamete egg? And let's see what happens. Well, when that occurs, when fertilization occurs, uh, there is a fusion of the egg and the sperm. There are 23 chromosomes each combined to create the zygote, which is the first new cell of the next organism. So in order for fertilization to occur, sperm need to reach the secondary oocyte that was ovulated from the egg. <clears throat> Hopefully the egg has made its way into the fallopian tube or oviduct or uterine tube, um, probably about the level of the ampulla that we discussed. Um, the sperm will meet the egg. One egg penetrates the sperm uh, and then fertilization will occur and we'll have a uh, zygote created. Um, it takes sperm a couple hours uh, to travel through the female duct system and reach the egg. And it's going to take many, many sperm to be able to break down. So you've got the corona radiata on the outside of the egg cell, but then you have the zona pellucida, that thick jelly-like substance around the outside of the egg. Um, and the sperm actually have to release enzymes from that specialized lysosome, that acrosome, um, to break down the zona pellucida. And then when one sperm plasma membrane fuses with the egg plasma membrane, um, it will get brought in and actually the zona pellucida is going to harden to prevent any more sperm from getting into the egg. So we as humans are the result of monospermy, one sperm, one egg. Um, and not polyspermy. So if more than one sperm happened to get inside of the egg, uh, it would not uh, carry on. Fertilization wouldn't actually occur. So millions of sperm are ejaculated. However, maybe a few hundred are going to actually make it to the oocyte because as we discussed, the female genitalia or female reproductive tract, excuse me, is not laying out a red carpet for sperm, right? Um, there's acid, there's mucus, there's white blood cells that are going to be um, trying to get rid of them. There's also a, you know, cilia that are creating this current of flowing out. Sperm are trying to swim upstream. It's a very perilous journey. But once the, the sperm have reached the oocyte, um, their acrosomal enzymes, as I mentioned, from the acrosome are going to be released. An interesting thing about sperm is that once they are ejaculated into um, the female reproductive tract, it actually takes some time for them to swim to the egg. And the egg is actually kind of sending out signals chemically that are calling the sperm towards it. And sperm being inside of the female reproductive tract activates them. And that activation is actually called capacitation. Um, so you can think about how the acrosome, the lysosome on the top of the sperm, they almost have like a little wax cap on it. Like a, like when you get a new pen, you have a wax cap on the pen. Um, and it's the female reproductive tract that actually kind of wears away that wax cap on the, lys on the acrosome, excuse me, so that when it reaches the egg, it has the ability to do the acrosomal reaction. So once one sperm has entered and it's met with the egg, another reaction is going to occur and that's called the cortical reaction. So millions of sperm and now hundreds of sperm are actually getting to the egg. Their little acrosomes are gonna start putting out their acrosomal enzymes that are gonna start chewing down the zona pellucida. It's going to take multiple sperm to chew down the zona pellucida. When a sperm's plasma membrane finally fuses with the plasma membrane of the egg, a cortical reaction occurs. And that cortical reaction is here on this next slide. <clears throat> so let's see here. So we have a sperm approaching the egg in number one. Um, number two, the sperm's acrosomal enzymes digest the egg's jelly coat. That's the zona pellucida. Um, there is actually a special um, protein receptor on the sperm and on the egg that are connecting with each other. At this point, all of the doors to the egg's plasma membrane are open. Like, come in, I'm ready. 
However, number four, when the plasma membrane of the sperm and egg fuse, a cortical reaction, cortical reaction happens. The egg actually surges out calcium. And calcium, basically, all these little purple protein receptors that you see along the outside get pulled in. Essentially, the doors get slammed shut in all the other sperm's faces. And the zona pellucida is going to harden and trap any sperm um, that are in there. Uh, the sperm essentially just delivers this thing in yellow here, which is the nucleus that has the 23 chromosomes. The sperm nucleus uh, is going to now come together with the egg nucleus. And remember, this act of fertilization actually caused the secondary oocyte to finish going through meiosis two. So it's now the you know ovum that we need, that 23 chromosome haploid ovum. So the egg nucleus in blue, the sperm nucleus, um, in yellow are going to fuse to create now the zygote. Interestingly enough, this is all inside of the egg itself. And we talked about how the egg is the largest human cell that we have. It can be seen with the naked eye. It's huge. It has tons of cytoplasm, tons of organelles, tons of cellular inclusions. Well, why? Well, we can see we have the zygote here. This is our first new cell of life. The egg environment has to be able to nourish and support and protect it until implantation into the uterine lining occurs. So that's why we have all this excess stuff inside the egg and why the egg is as big as it is. So here's a picture of an egg and sperm cells trying to penetrate. We'll watch those videos in class. Okay, so the zygote. It might take a couple hours for the zygote to start dividing, okay? Um, once it goes through the dividing, it's going to go through a couple different stages. Um, some developmentally significant stages are the morula phase when it's about 16 cells and it looks like a mulberry. That's where that name comes from. And then finally, that 100 cell blastocyst. So I drew on the board um, the blastocyst for everybody that had the inner cell mass and the trophoblast. That is the developmental point that needs to be achieved in order for fertilization, I'm sorry, implantation to happen. So from fertilization to blastocyst, it's 100 cells. <clears throat> the embryo needs to become this blastocyst in order to implant into the endometrium. And so we learned about the reproductive cycle of the female and that after ovulation, which occurs on day 14 in a 24 28 day perfect cycle. Day 14 would be ovulation. Um, after that, the corpus luteum is left behind and developing in the ovary and it's producing progesterone, trying to build up the endometrial wall in case of implantation happens. Well, fertilization happened. Now we have a zygote. This developing zygote morula blastocyst is going to be producing a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin. Now, in normal circumstances, if pregnancy did not happen, the corpus luteum is only going to live for 14 days. Well, because the developing embryo is producing human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG, that is feeding back to the brain, which is feeding back to the corpus luteum. Hey, baby on board, keep producing progesterone. Do not let the um, endometrium start shedding. The blastocyst has two parts to it. It has the trophoblast, which is the ring of cells around. I'm not sure if I can draw. Can I draw? I can't draw. I'll just talk about it. Um, the trophoblast is the outer ring of cells, and then we have the inner cell mass. That's the little blob that is going to end up becoming the actual embryo, fetus, what have you. Um, and then the trophoblast becomes extra embryonic tissue, which we mentioned was like placenta, umbilical cord, amniotic sac. So here's a trophoblast. So trophoblast is the purple cells on the outside. The inner cell mass is that green blob. That's what's going to differentiate into ectoderm, endoderm, mesoderm. The entire structure is a blastocyst, and that is 100 cells. Um, this is showing the endometrium in yellow here. This is going to implant um, in, into the endometrial or uterine lining, and that's where development is going to happen. So this is showing from a fertilized egg going into different stages here. And uh, the one on the left-hand side where it says pointing to cavity, inner cell mass, what have you, that is the blastocyst. That is 100 cells. That's the important stage that needs to be reached in order for <clears throat> 
implantation to occur. That green part, the inner cell mass, is going to differentiate into the ectoderm, the endoderm, and the mesoderm. The endoderm is going to become all of our organ systems that are exposed to the outside and have um, a mucosa. So that would be digestive, respiratory, reproductive, urinary. Ectoderm is going to develop into your skin and your nervous system. So things that are kind of on the outer periphery of your body. And then the mesoderm is basically gonna be everything else in between. So stuff like your cardiovascular system, um, your lymphatic system, etc. <clears throat> so around day 14, the uh, endometrium is basically grown around and enclosed the embryo. Uh, the trophoblast is going to grow into a structure called the chorionic villi, uh, which is going to combine with the mother's tissue to form the placenta. So the placenta is essentially part mom, part developing embryo that comes together. And when we learned about the placenta and we learned about the umbilical vein and the umbilical artery, um, we know that mom and baby's blood do not mix, okay? But it is a blood-rich organ where exchanges are gonna happen between mom and developing embryo. Embryonic tissue is gonna be surrounded by a fluid-filled sac called the amnion, and the umbilical cord is going to be developed um, <clears throat> between baby and the placenta, which is essentially between developing fetus and mom, and that's where exchanges are going to occur. So this is probably about five to six weeks, I'd say. So you can very clearly see a head, arms, legs, the heart, um, the amniotic sac out here actually ends up becoming part of our digestive system. Um, the chorionic villi, which were coming from baby, that fuse with this early placenta here. So by the eighth week of gestation, all body systems are going to be formed. After week 12, uh, the embryo is going to now be called a fetus, and we're getting into our you know second trimester. Uh, so during the first trimester, everything is being formed. All right, and then the second and third trimester are things maturing and getting larger, um, developing things like fat under the subcutaneous layer and stuff like that. Um, so things like teratogens, which are environmental or chemical factors that can cause you know, genetic mutations are especially um, vulnerable to cause issues during that first trimester when everything is being laid down. So actual time of gestation is from the first day of the last period to birth, which is about 280 days. So this is a human. Look at us, an early, early humans. We have tails and we have weird heads that kind of make us look like we're a lizard or a chicken. Um, maybe I'm gonna get a slide up here next time that looks at like early embryological structures to see how similar we are. So here is all the way to the left is five weeks. Then we have 14 weeks and then we have 20 weeks. So at 20 weeks, that's often when they'll do a pretty complicated ultrasound to look at all the organ systems. They can you know, identify the sex of the baby if that's something that parents want to know, but they're going to spend a long time looking all at all the organ systems, seeing if, the, if, there are, if everything's normal or if there are any malformations. All right, pregnancy, time of conception to birth. So you've got the uterus, which is gonna house the developing embryo, fetus, baby, what have you. That's gonna go from the size of a pear to, oh, I'd say if we're gonna stick with fruit, like the size of you know a watermelon. It's gonna take up the entire pelvic cavity, part of the abdominal cavity, and potentially even stretch up and push up into the thoracic cavity. So that placenta, that new organ that is um, developed during pregnancy is gonna be res responsible for producing Hormones like progesterone. Progesterone is going to keep the uterine lining quiet and intact and from not shedding. And then relaxin is actually going to help the hips widen in preparation for birth. Um, 
So mom is not only, you know, having to filter her own blood, she's going to have to filter baby's blood. And because of this, there is a 25 to 40% increase in blood volume. So just being pregnant itself is gonna be causing an extra strain on the cardiovascular system, the heart, uh, as well as the kidneys. Um, and contrary to popular belief, people are, are not quote unquote eating for two. Um, pregnant women only have to consume about 300 extra calories per day. Um, and if you are doing any type of caloric count on anything, 300 calories isn't that much. What does pregnancy affect? You know, besides your emotions and all of that stuff and your soul, um, gastrointestinal tract. So you have baby that's now taking up a big part of the abdominal pelvic cavity that could be compressing upon your, you know, large intestine, providing some constipation or maybe even leading to some straining that could lead to hemorrhoids. Um, you could have baby kind of pushing up on the stomach, which could end up causing like reflux and heartburn. Uh, the urinary tract. So because you have, you know, 25 to 40% increase in blood volume, you're going to have a 25 to 45% increase in urine output. Uh, the respiratory system. So babies take up a big part of the, you know, abdominal cavity where you've got the diaphragm separating the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity. The diaphragm is supposed to move down in order for you to breathe. Um, if you've got something there preventing, you know, movement of that diaphragm, it could make you get out of breath very quickly. I definitely know what that feels like. And again, the cardiovascular system. So with that increased blood volume, it's going to be extra strain on the heart in order to pump that around. All right, birth. So birth, just like, you know, all the other words we've learned, uh, has a name called parturition. parturition. You might have heard the word like postpartum, which is after birth. Um, it occurs about 280 days after the last first day of menstrual cycle. And then labor is the series of events that expel both baby and the placenta out of mom. So towards the end of gestation, which is about 40 weeks, progesterone is going to decrease and estrogen is going to increase. And it's going to prod the myometrium to start um, developing these oxytocin receptors. Oxytocin is going to be coming from the hypothalamus, but it's stored in the posterior pituitary, which is going to cause strong uterine contractions. So the fetus has now you know, larger, it's compressing on the cervix. The cervix is gonna start producing prostaglandins, so local hormones that are gonna cause some kind of micro contractions, if you will, uh, which that process is gonna feed back up to the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus is going to get on board and start to produce oxytocin. This is one of our two positive feedback mechanisms that the stimulus is gonna have a result that's just gonna get stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, and it's going to keep on getting stronger until you know baby and placenta have come out. Uh, you may have seen a labor and delivery if you've gone there for clinical yet, uh, that if they want to induce somebody into labor, they give them Pitocin, which is synthetic oxytocin to get their body in that positive feedback mechanism. So we've got three stages of labor dilation, expulsion, and the placental phase. Uh, dilation usually takes the longest, and that is waiting for the cervix. And again, it's the cervix, the opening to the uterus, not the vagina, that's gotta dilate to 10 centimeters. Typically, it is the longest stage. Um, expulsion is baby coming out. Um, if it's going to be happening vaginally, it's usually um, head first, face down type of thing is the preferred position. Um, and then the placenta also has to come out. So once baby is out, they're going to clamp the cord. Uh, clamping the cord is gonna cause the placenta to start to kind of tear away from the uterine lining, and that has to be expelled as well. So here we see baby coming out head first, so normal vaginal delivery. Um, baby's gonna come out, crowning is the head coming out. Hopefully they're gonna be face down. Head and shoulders are typically the hardest thing to come out and then everything usually just kind of comes after that. Uh, they will clamp the cord. That clamping will kind of change the blood flow and now the placenta is going to come off. And that's the beautiful uh, stages of delivery.